In the jungle of South America, a bronze axe is found, a cult object from the time before Columbus, which should not be here at all. Is it possible that warriors from the old world journeyed as far as Quillap, the most powerful fortress in America? Relics of the legendary cloud warriors, the Chachapoya, these mummies conceal a baffling mystery. Over the course of time, I've come across such a large amount of evidence from a wide variety of areas, which all points towards one theory. That in ancient times, people from the old world reached Peru and joined forces with the Chachapoya. The Phoenicians, a seafaring people, founded Carthage at the site of unique strategic importance in the Mediterranean. From here, the trading metropolis rules the center of the ancient world. With its fortress-like location and secure natural harbor, nothing can stop the nation becoming the number one sea power. Precious resources and luxury goods arrive here from all over the world in a ceaseless flow, laying the foundation for incredible wealth. The harbor at Carthage was the gateway to the known world at that time, and sometimes even further afield. War galleys with 170 oarsmen or more set sail from here. The first of these galleys were triremes with three rows of oars, but then came the even more powerful ships. Thus, the Carthaginian captains dared to sail far out into the Atlantic. They ventured up the western coast of Africa as far as present-day Cameroon. From Morocco, they were able to control the trade in gold. They obtained copper from Tartessos, and the Celtic city of Coruña dominated sea routes to the north, to the tin miles of Cornwall in Britain. Their best warriors came from the Balearic Islands. For many years, Hans Gifhorn has studied the ancient history of the Spanish islands. He is particularly fascinated by the cultural legacy of the Phoenicians. The German professor takes a keen interest in the ancient legends, valuable sources of lost knowledge. Hans Gifhorn finds it impossible to believe that such a capable people as the Carthaginians simply vanished. When their trading empire collapsed, surely the survivors would have started a new life somewhere else. He is convinced of this. He begins his search for clues here on the Balearic Islands. Phoenicians and Carthaginians often journeyed to Mallorca, establishing trading settlements as they did in the Mediterranean and further afield. Many thousands of Iberian soldiers fought in the Carthaginian army, which included men from various nations. The stone slingers from the Balearic Islands were considered particularly effective, forming a much feared elite. Hard to imagine that these wild warriors and their proud generals from Carthage would have let themselves be enslaved. But what alternatives were open to them? Did they flee across the ocean to Peru? Are the dead at Kuilap the descendants of these Celts and Carthaginians, as Professor Giffon suggests? Carthage, the most important port of its day, the nautical skills of the Phoenicians are a key element in Gifhorn's hypothesis. The cargo port at Carthage was open to all ships, but only Carthaginian warships were allowed through the barrage gate. Behind this gate, secret boathouses had been constructed, each six meters wide and 30 meters long, space for 350 warships with a crew of 100,000 men. 
On land, too, the superpower spread fear and terror. Its war elephants were a feared weapon. So much power also provoked bitter resistance. The up-and-coming Rome soon became a dangerous rival. After three bloody wars, the Roman Empire was able to defeat Carthage. Hundreds of thousands died in the burning city. Countless more enslaved. But many must have been able to flee. Professor Gifhorn believes that many of the elite warriors managed to escape. Their trail takes us to northern Spain. For 2,000 years, the Tower of Hercules at Coruña has been shining across the ocean. It was built by the Romans, based on the great Pharos of Alexandria, one of the seven wonders of the world. Ever since then, the light has shone over the Atlantic. Far out over the water, into the dreaded Bay of Biscay, on the sea route to America, just as was the case 2,000 years ago. When the harbour at Coruña was an important staging post for ships heading to northern shores. Here, seafarers from Carthage and throughout the Mediterranean came into contact with Celtic Iberians who had been sailing the northern ocean for thousands of years. Business is conducted. The riches of the country traded for precious goods from overseas, a practice that continues today among the descendants of the Celts and the Carthaginians. Trade brings the world together. Information is passed on, all the latest news. Wild rumors circulate about goods and technologies not yet known here, but earlier also about unexplored coastlines beyond the horizon. About voyages of discovery made by the sea captains of Carthage, which took them right across the Atlantic. Perhaps they even got as far as Brazil. Even if it were theoretically possible for the Carthaginians to have reached Brazil, this doesn't indicate by any means that they really got there. More evidence would be required, and such evidence is found in the writings of ancient historians, such as Diodorus. The Greek historian Diodorus reports in his History of the World that the Carthaginians had discovered paradise far beyond all known inhabited countries, a land with wild animals, rivers that could be navigated by ship, and high mountains. But they kept this discovery a secret. Perhaps this is where they set sail from. Carthaginian refugees and their Celtic allies from Spain. It seems to me that without the nautical skills of the Carthaginians, it would hardly have been possible for the Celtic Iberians and the stone slingers of Majorca to cross the Atlantic. Carthaginian sea captains perfected the nautical legacy of their Phoenician forefathers. They could ascertain their latitude by the length of the shadow cast by the midday sun. At night, they would navigate by the polar star in the constellation of the Little Bear, the star known as the Phoenician star in ancient times. As has always been the case, ships are driven by the winds and ocean currents across the Atlantic from West Africa to the northeastern coast of Brazil. Janice Jakite has also crossed the Atlantic, entirely by herself. This woman from Heidelberg covered the 6,500 kilometers from southern Portugal to the Caribbean island of Barbados using her own muscle power. It took her 90 days and she used a high-tech rowing boat.
Of course, it wasn't like a lake in the park. There were some critical situations, waves up to eight or nine meters high, collisions or near misses with fishing trawlers and getting caught in their nets. Naturally, the main problem is that you need fresh water and food. Of course, you're constantly exposed to the sun, the heat, but you're permanently soaking wet. Once you're in the boat, you can't turn back and row against the current, against the wind. So, in other words, you just have to make it. Even in ancient times, large boats rowed by strong men must somehow have been able to do it. Once they were on the water, they would have had to get there. After three weeks on the high seas, the Carthaginian ships could have reached the tropical coastline. They would not have imagined that they had discovered a completely new world. The island of Itamaracá lies off the coast of Brazil an ideal landing site for Carthaginians, since the islands, which are close to the coast, could be used as a base that is easy to defend. Fort Orange here dates back to the 17th century. Underneath the Dutch fortress, there are remains of an ancient Indian settlement, as indicated by ceramic fragments found here. Everywhere, curious fragments of white clay are lying around in the sand. These are the remains of Dutch clay pipes. We found more than 5,000 of them. They certainly smoked a lot here at Fort Orange. Up to now, the archaeologist has not found any traces of Carthaginians and little remains of the original inhabitants. In ancient times, exhausted seafarers would have found conditions here extremely difficult after crossing the Atlantic. The archaeologist is convinced of that. The kind of dangers facing them are outlined in an account by a German mercenary. In the 16th century, Hans Staden is taken prisoner by cannibals off the coast of Brazil. He sees how these people slaughter their enemies, cut them into pieces, and then eat them. However, as well as portraying such gruesome practices, he also describes the inhabitants here as very open to trade by barter. And that was exactly the strength of the Carthaginians. Could this have been their chance of survival? There are no accounts of a transatlantic expedition to Brazil at any time before Columbus. But not far from the coast, at Rio Paraíba, there is an archaeological site which could be extremely significant, the legendary Pedra do Inga. The rock is part of a huge natural monument. Countless figures and glyphs have been engraved into the monolith. Ever since their discovery, they have bewildered experts. Here in Paraíba, a very long time ago, the Ataco Atara culture existed. Many engravings in stone remain from this period, such as here, of the Rock of the Inga. But we don't know how these people thought or how they behaved. We simply are not able to understand the messages they've left. How were they created? Which people immortalized themselves at the Rock of the Inga? It's a mystery. However, does it seem likely that the people who did this were not simple natives? Maybe it was a completely different culture 2,000 years ago. At an early stage, local archaeologists noticed that many of the petroglyphs on the Rock of the Inga displayed similarities with writing from the Old World in classical times. I've studied this. Only similarities with individual letters were found, not with complete words. However, similarities were mainly with letters from a Celtic Iberian alphabet. Four symbols engraved on the stone resemble letters from ancient European languages. We know their phonetic value, but so far it has not been possible to translate the engravings on this Brazilian rock monument into a meaningful text. Merchants or settlers 
would hardly consider the parched hinterland of the Rio Paraiba a Garden of Eden. And the river itself is not navigable for very far. The tropical coastal region gives way to a desert of rock and dust. A dead end for seafarers, as any explorers would soon discover. Their only alternative would be to return to the Atlantic coast. To the northwest, there is a river of dimensions that almost beggar belief, surrounded by dense jungle, the Amazon. Tropical rainforests would hardly have been a new site for seafarers from Carthage. They may well have seen similar vegetation in Africa. But how would the jungle have struck their Celtic allies? Fascinating? Menacing? Lurking in the green hell were the original inhabitants. In the year 1492, the unwieldy ships Christopher Columbus had for his expedition took 36 days to cover the distance from the Canary Islands to the Bahamas. This is twice as far as the shortest distance between West Africa and South America. By taking the fastest route, seafarers in ancient times could also have reached Brazil. The natives immediately spot any intruders who don't know the law of the jungle and find it difficult to master the situation, even with superior weapon technology. Thus, Spanish and Portuguese invaders had sad stories to tell when they attempted to colonize the Amazon in the 16th century. Everything is hostile and death lurks everywhere. It could have been exactly like this 2,000 years ago too. The first rule of survival for any stranger here is not to venture too far from the shelter of the ship. And to bring with you plenty of colorful presents for the locals, as the conquistadors did. For a tribal chief, perhaps a metal axe from a Carthaginian workshop in southern Spain would be appropriate. It is close to the Amazon Delta that the Portuguese established their first base, Belém. From here, they exploit the tropical wealth around them. With the blessing and encouragement of their god, as they announced to the wild heathens. In Belém today, archaeologists are hard at work studying Indian culture. The Gurdi Institute has gathered evidence about Amazonian tribes which were neither wild nor non-religious. For thousands of years, there was a developed civilization here. Even the Brazilian cult garment, the tanga, was invented at that time, as shown by this ceramic version. Dr. Maura da Silveira is the curator of the archaeological treasures of the Amazon. Every day, objects thousands of years old are stored in her vaults. Special cult objects were made from precious materials. This valuable spearhead from rock crystal is a highlight of the collection. Terracotta idols painted in rich colors bear witness to the complex religious beliefs of the Marashuara. This is a phallus symbol, a terracotta cult object from the Marajó. The Amazonian culture at that time was highly developed. The people lived on man-made islands that had been constructed in the marsh. It was also used as a rattle. The very first people to excavate this area were staggered by the extraordinary finds dating back to the Marajó civilization. The funeral urns painted in a variety of colors, are reminiscent of classical forms found in the Mediterranean. Greek vases with Celtic spiral patterns. 
The Amazon basin has been settled for 11,000 years, but for a long time the population here was small. But 2,000 years ago there was a population explosion, and this growth took place extremely quickly. In 1541, according to an eyewitness, a Spanish expedition ventured up the Amazon in search of the legendary country of gold. The chronicler reports that they were suddenly attacked. Arrows rained down upon them from the densely populated riverbank. Naked, light-skinned women were fighting in the front line of the enemy forces. It was reports about these fearless Amazons that led to the river being given its present name, although such accounts were considered untrustworthy by many. This skepticism was unfounded, as recent archaeological excavations show. In the Amazon region, there really were large settlements with thousands of inhabitants. The population was supported by lush fields of maize, tended with special agricultural techniques. The Amazon is home to the plant that will provide seeds which, as cocoa, will conquer the entire world. That the Spanish Celts ate chocolate here 2,000 years ago is pure speculation. Only now has an understanding about the flourishing Amazon civilization been rediscovered. Today, experts have no doubt whatsoever. 2,000 years ago, a cultural revolution took place there. The formal style used by artists developed in leaps and bounds. Did the impulse come from the other side of the ocean? This special ceramic style is really fascinating. It was first developed in Marajó. Funeral urns in such a range of colors only appeared in the upper Amazon region much later than this. That's why I believe that the development began in Marajó and influenced the other regions later. It's often suggested that this new style might come from outside the region. The fact that the archaeological finds recall Mediterranean objects raises a fascinating possibility. Could seafarers have brought new ideas from the old world 2,000 years ago? Heinz Budweig is convinced that this was the case. The German-Brazilian amateur archaeologist has found more evidence, an ancient axe. As far as Budweig is concerned, this is 100% proof that foreign explorers landed in Brazil long before Columbus. The merchant told me it came from Rio Guapore, the river that forms the border between Brazil and Bolivia. And he said he bought it direct from a Bolivian Indian. The thing has to be genuine. Even the wooden handle was still quite damp. A chance find. A metal axe encrusted with patina, with a wooden handle. But what does the figure on the blade of the axe represent? The head of a bull. Or it could perhaps be an antelope. But in any case, it's an animal that didn't exist in South America. Heinz Budweig does everything he can to shed light on the mysterious find from the jungle. In the Geoscience Institute of the University of Sao Paulo, scientists examine the axe with the latest laboratory technology. The result comes as a surprise. The axe head is 61% copper and 39% zinc. And metal alloys like this didn't exist in America before the arrival of Europeans. Another important point is that the wooden handle comes from a forest in the Pantanal, a marshy region around the Rio Paraguay. And this wood has been dated by scientific methods. It's about 1,500 years old. Even 2,000 years ago, there was an extensive trading network based on the rivers of the Amazon basin. Could this have been how the cult axe got to the interior of the continent? Did Celts and Carthaginians 
simply follow the watercourse from the coast, heading further and further upstream. It has been reported that Indians escaping from slave traders fled as far as the Chachapoya. This means they covered the huge distance of almost 4,000 kilometers from the Atlantic coast of Brazil to Peru. So evidently, the journey would not have been impossible for determined individuals. But could emigrants from the old world also have done this? Made their way through the biggest jungle in the world, threatened by wild animals and unknown diseases? In the end, the refugees would have found a gigantic mountain range blocking their path, the Andes. Does the trail of the Celts and the Carthaginians lead here, to Kuilap, the most gigantic of the Chachapoya structures? The biggest fortress ever built in South America. The computer reconstruction reveals that in terms of the mass of stone used, Kuilap is even bigger than the Cheops pyramid in Egypt. The Chachapoya were fantastic masons. They even buried the dead in their houses. But where did they obtain the knowledge that enabled them to build structures like this, 3,000 meters high? Ornamental decorations on the houses bear witness to an artistic sensibility. A sophisticated sewage system indicates high standards of hygiene and comfort. They're really best known for their architecture, but that is what we see now. That's the best preserved thing that sits on the surface as we as visitors walk around. And some of it is really quite spectacular. Some of it is monumental. It speaks power. Peter Lerche has been living in Peru for over 30 years. He was even mayor of the provincial capital. He is completely captivated by the people here, the living and the dead. How can we explain Kula? All the C-14 analyses we performed so far suggest that it's not really very old. It dates from around 800 AD. The exception is here at the main entrance, 500 AD. The first time I encountered Kualap, I was particularly puzzled because no other fortress in the whole of America displays similar construction techniques. But I knew fortresses like this were quite common in the Mediterranean region during classical times. One detail of the main temple in Kualap appears to support Gifhorn's theory. The head engraved in the wall is reminiscent of a gruesome cult on the other side of the Atlantic. There, the Celts would decapitate their prisoners and hang their heads on their houses, a proud demonstration of power. Did the Chachapoya also practice this ritual? The Celtic custom of using human heads as trophies is connected with their belief that the soul resides in the skull. That's why they treated the head as hugely important. And this also explains why they were masters of trepanation, but they weren't the only ones. Both the Celts and the Chachapoya would make a hole in the skull of a sick person to relieve pressure on the brain and drive away evil spirits. In the case of the Chachapoya, we know they use this technique because it's described in Hippocratic accounts dating back to about 500 BC. And trepanation was also practiced later by the Celts, which we know from archaeological finds in Lower Austria. So this represents a very interesting parallel between the cultures. Is the use of the same healing method evidence of contact between the two cultures? Pieces of a jigsaw puzzle which add up to irrefutable evidence, as Professor Gifhorn believes. The decisive proof may well be hidden in Kualap. The Chachapoya were special in the sense that they did these kinds of uh, very intricate stonework. The building is supercharged with power whatever those symbols mean, and they meant something, and very powerful to the Chachapoya. Who were the inhabitants of this place, and which traditions did they follow in their lives? Peter Lerche knows the facts. 
Here we have a particularly large Chacha roundhouse. We can see holes in the walls where beams were placed to support the second floor, to form the floor above. Two-story houses were required in Kualap to make maximum use of the space available, because 3,000 people lived here. To this day, the natives of the Andean highlands tend their fields using methods and implements handed down from their forefathers. Agriculture in the days of the Chachapoya would not have looked very different. Back then, in the highland region of Peru, The Marignon Canyon is deeper and wider than the Grand Canyon in the United States. This is a hard place to live, and really it's been very hard for many archaeologists to accept that anybody would want to live there. What are they doing here? Why do they want to live there? And it sets up the mystery. Okay, clearly they didn't choose to live there. The massive citadel of the Chachapoya still conceals many puzzles. But Professor Giffon believes he is close to finding solutions. Fortresses like Kualap are not found anywhere in America, but archaeologists have never considered that an explanation of its origin might be found outside America. On the other side of the Atlantic, the remains of a fortress city can be found on man-made terraces. Iberian Celts constructed the city over 2,000 years ago, just before or after the destruction of Carthage. And, just as in Kuilap, the houses were built on round stone foundations. Here too, the people who built the city chose an extraordinary location. Perfectly protected from the rest of Iron Age Europe by thick walls. The similarities between the Celtic settlement on the Atlantic coast of Spain and the mountain fortress in the Andes are staggering. Did the people who constructed these places know about each other? The mystery can only be explained in South America. There is still no conclusive proof that Celts and Carthaginians were ever present in Peru. Even for the Incas, the kingdom of the Chachapoya was simply too remote. Hardly any chroniclers from the Spanish colonial period ventured this far either. Today, the Chachapoya settlements are ghost towns, hidden on steep rock faces. Funeral figures bear witness to their strange ancestral cult. Archaeologists are exploring a burial site that was erected at a dizzying height. The warriors buried here were headhunters, making them unique in the entire Andean Highlands, people surrounded by mystery. German archaeologist Klaus Korschmieder has also become fascinated by the Chachupoya. Burying people in houses is actually quite normal for the Chachapoya. We find quite frequent evidence of burials in the roundhouses. However, this might indicate an origin in the Amazon Basin region, because it's still the custom there to bury people in houses. The ritual sites are decorated with paintings, and despite the tropical climate, since they are protected by the steep rock faces, they can still be made out quite clearly. There are figures in splendid costumes, crowned with clumps of feathers or wreaths of light. Another excavation also reveals a being with a magnificent headdress. In the Celtic mythology of ancient Europe, the god Senunos was depicted with similar antlers as can be seen here on the silver cauldron of Gundestrup in Denmark. Here we have an extraordinary image of a boat with a person sitting inside it. On the other side is a very simple, similar example. Klaus Korschmieder 
also thinks the Chachapoya moved here from the east, although his east is only a few hundred kilometers away in the Amazon region. Only the dead know the truth. Every storm reveals more skeletons and destroys other traces of the Chachapoya. For days now, it has again been raining without a break in the Cordilleras. The sources of the Amazon are transformed into raging torrents. In Limimbamba, the people are not the only ones who have learned to come to terms with these natural forces. Everybody makes the best of the situation, which is likely to be repeated many times during the rainy season. Probably the, one of the biggest concerns was just the severe weather. Tremendous hailstorms there, great uh, rainstorms, unlike any rainstorms I'd ever experienced anywhere in the world. Uh, I've seen in Chechapoyas, it just seems like the sky is absolutely falling and the ground under your feet turns into liquid. Um, it's from one rainstorm to the next, valleys transform with landslides. It's a very dynamic uh, environment and it makes perfect sense that they lived on the top of the mountain just for that very reason. In April 1997, the ethnologist Peter Lerche is alarmed by an appeal for help. Grave robbers were plundering a burial site dating to pre-Columbian times, and many of the mummies had been left in the rain, unprotected. Now there is no time to lose. Lerche organizes a rescue expedition, and they set off up the mountain from Lemebamba. Their destination is the Laguna de los Condores, the Lagoon of the Condors. Local farmers have discovered a previously unknown burial site at an altitude of 2,600 meters, and the team, headed by the German-Peruvian Lerche, hopes to preserve it. The grave robbers have been busy, and the place is a shocking sight. Many of the sarcophagi have been smashed, the graves devastated, and there are fragments of Chachapoya mummies scattered around. The rescuers decide to perform an emergency excavation. In the end, they manage to transport over 200 mummies to the provincial capital. Today, the dead from the Lagoon of the Condors are kept in Limabamba. The bodies were originally sewn inside sacks in a crouching position. After being excavated, some of the mummies were examined at the University of Vienna. These people died before the Spanish arrived. However, the surprising thing is that they show traces of diseases which had been assumed to arrive in South America with the Europeans. In Göttingen, paleopathologist Professor Schulz performs research he attempts to obtain information from the mortal remains of our ancestors about the sicknesses they suffered and the causes of their deaths, and the extraordinarily large extent of tuberculosis among the Chachapoya arouses his interest too. Here we have a lesion which is typical for tuberculosis. The structure is ulcerated and eaten away. And these typical changes in bone structure caused by tuberculosis were found in skeletons and mummies of the Chachapoya. Which is, of course, extremely curious, because we now have evidence that the disease was present in the Chachapoya population to a significant degree, even in the time before Columbus. At the same time, evidence of tuberculosis alone does not prove there was transatlantic contact with the Chachapoya before Columbus. Ancient traces of the disease have also been found in other areas of South America. The cases of tuberculosis we've so far been able to prove among the Chachapoya really do correspond to cases that we know from the classical period. If these people were the descendants of people who came from the old world, that would be a possible explanation. And we could go further, suggesting that maybe the disease found its way to the new world by this route at a relatively early stage. Wherever the people who constructed Kuilap came from, 
Why did they build such a massive fortress here anyway? Peter Lerche suggests that Kuilap was a bulwark against invaders from the lowland regions to provide protection against neighboring tribes who suffered from starvation during the regular droughts. Archaeologists have found more than 50 skeletons here with skulls that were smashed in. Were the victims attackers or defenders? The fatal injuries could have been caused by axes or slingshots. One thing is certain, they died violent deaths. That frontier um, can be often a place of lots of jockeying for position for who gets to trade with who, who gets the wealth, who uh, gets to occupy the site at the trailhead, who gets this much take, who gets to be the middleman. And so I'm sure that there was a great deal of internal politicking, shuffling, squabbling, and probably uh, bloodshed. The administrative center of the province of Chachapoya today deals in precious metals and drugs. But the proceeds are invested elsewhere. The collection of mummies in the local archaeological museum also seems slightly dusty. But anthropologists here are gathering important information about the fate of the Chachapoya and about their origins. This mummy is one of a family. It's a 25-year-old woman with her six-year-old child and her husband. The holes in the skull, three in the back of the head and one in the forehead, appear to have been made during wartime. Again and again, they find indications of unnatural causes of death, traces of murder and violence. The Chachapoya had the reputation of being an extremely warlike people, and they used slingshots as their main weapon, both to defend themselves against attack and to attack their enemies. They used slingshots, which differed completely from those used by the other tribes in Peru. Once again, the trail leads us back to the old world, to Mallorca. Here we find a world champion on his way to a training session, a king among stone slingers. He is the Balearic's champion with a fine record of direct hits, but his rivals are working hard, so Juan Caballero spends all his free time practicing. Professor Gifhorn has brought the champion a reconstructed original Chachapoya slingshot from Peru, almost 10,000 kilometers away. When this is compared with the traditional slingshot from Mallorca, the expert is startled to discover that the two are practically identical. Even the special way of fastening the loop around the projectile is exactly the same. Juan remembers that his ancestors used to wrap the slingshots around their heads. The Chachapoya also had the habit of proudly wearing their slingshots to adorn their heads. But this custom has died out now. In the Huancas community in Peru, some traditions have been maintained. Many of the inhabitants here still have typical Chachapoya names, as has been the case for centuries. Clotilda Alva, a potter, is one of those who are proud of her legendary ancestors. Pottery is an ancient tradition from the time of the Chachapoya. It has outlasted the arrival of the Spaniards. We do know that Chachapoya were actually very active traders. They're in the perfect position of middlemen. Uh, everybody wants to be a middleman. It's the most lucrative, really, position. So they could 
Uh, they had maximum exposure to all of these things, which really is one reason why they have um, so many different influences in their art and their architecture uh, and their culture. They really have the best of all worlds at their fingertips, like New York City, in the sense that um, they were almost a port of trade, uh, geographically speaking, very strategic. The women were also highly prized. A painting from the Inca period shows captured Chachapoya women with light skin and reddish blonde hair. The king of the Incas would choose the most beautiful girls for himself. Perhaps one would be a blonde, like Cecilia Flores. She lives at the edge of a village in Huancas with her family and a lot of pets. In appearance, it is easy to distinguish her from the dark-haired, brown-skinned neighbours. Cecilia lives the life of a typical local woman, which includes a division of labour. Each day, she takes her husband something to eat and drink at his workplace, as has always been the custom. She can't explain why her appearance is so distinctive. I'm one of four children, and three of us have blonde hair. Two of my cousins do as well. They live in the city of Chachapoya, and also one of their daughters, while the others are all dark-haired. My father couldn't explain to us why we are so blonde. His grandparents also had hair like this. There's no statement that says all the touch point were white. Ciesa de Leon um, remarked after travels throughout Peru and throughout the Indies as they were known and Panama and the areas that he walked through, uh, he said, these people, these Chachapoya, are the whitest people I have seen. They are uh, very agreeable, graceful. Uh, the women are, are beautiful and often taken as Inca concubines or wives. Um, and he described how they were dressed, sometimes with a slingshot uh, wrapped around the head of the males, um, woolen clothing or cotton clothing. Um, but he was clearly impressed with them uh, and thought they were attractive people. It is also said that there have always been a lot of light-skinned blonde locals in the village of Limabamba, although originally it was populated mainly by Indians. Just as in Huancas, nobody has any information about ancestors of any sort from Europe. A visit to an elementary school here confirms the reports. A significant number of the children here have light-coloured skin and blonde hair. Now saliva samples are being taken from these children in order to establish their genetic fingerprint. Little Valentina is also allowed to provide a sample, although only samples from male donors who are not related can provide meaningful results. The blonde girl comes from a native family, None of her relatives can recall any ancestors from a non-Indian background. Juan has given a saliva sample too. His red hair makes him an ideal test subject. However, as with the other pupils, this could be caused by a genetic mutation from exclusively Indian ancestors. Lab tests performed at the University of Rotterdam in the Netherlands are intended to clear up the issue. An international team of experts is already waiting for the samples from Peru in the Molecular Genetic Institute. Under the supervision of Professor Kaiser, the scientists succeed in identifying a special marker for hair color in the human genome. So now we have the first genetic results from the lab of the Gringito samples. And the first thing we looked for uh, is the question, is the red hair color of European origin or is it not of European origin? We use DNA analysis to basically classify the people according to their geographic origin. So what we see there is that these individuals are of mixed ancestry. So we indeed see uh, between 10 and 50% European origin, which does coincide with the red hair, 
but the remaining part of their genome, as far as we can say from our analysis, is of Native American origin. The genetic analysis also indicates which part of Europe the ancestors of the test person came from. Did seafarers from Europe really get as far as America in ancient times? Did they venture up the Amazon 2,000 years ago? As far as Peru into the land of the Chachapoya? Do these children carry the answer to this question in their genes? All the evidence we have at this moment really points to the western part of Europe. Uh, we detected a type of Y chromosome called R1B that has its, its highest frequency on the British Isles and in the northern part of the Iberian Peninsula. Galicia, once settled by Celts, is in northern Spain. Fresh fish is bought at auction on the quayside in Coruña and then taken straight to the market. The destiny of the people here is determined by fishing and sea trade. Did the forefathers of these Galicians take their biological and cultural legacy with them to Peru? Celtic warriors did have the ability to sail across the Atlantic 2,000 years ago. Together with the survivors of Carthage, the former superpower, who were forced to flee from the Roman legions, people with the courage of those who have nothing to lose. Refugees full of hope, of finding a new home on the other side of the ocean. Did they leave traces when they got to the New World? Roundhouses and fortress walls reminiscent of their homeland in Galicia? An axe decorated with an animal that was unknown in South America? Funeral urns with Celtic spiral patterns painted in a style familiar from the Mediterranean? or highly developed techniques of medical treatment, opinions about these theories differ. I do not see a break in the sequence. I don't see a cultural turnover. I don't see an invasion of foreign styles, foreign elements. Uh, something that indicates to me, whoa, wow, everything changed right here in the state. Obviously, because they are unique, uh, they attract a lot of attention. Hans Giffon is also convinced that his idea is correct. Now he places his hopes in scientific advances. There's been very little work on exploring the Chachapoya culture, so I'm expecting lots of surprises. So far, however, there are only suggestions that support the professor's vision. But no smoking gun as yet.